wonderful moment in the book where Edan Offer, who's the head of the uh, Israel Corporation, needs to, he wants to read uh, uh, a Harvard thesis about management. And if you and I were reading a Harvard thesis about management, we might, I don't know, sit in an armchair, take it to bed, I don't know, um, take it to the beach. He, he gets on his yacht, his $10 million yacht uh, in Monte Carlo, and by the time he gets off in Greece, he's read the thesis from, from Harvard, which is, you know, like, that's not something you can say about many people, that they chose to read the thesis on their $10 million yacht. Um, what, when, and you spent quite a lot of time with Idan Offer from, 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 your, from reading the book. Tell us about some of the, the, the characters involved that were a part of this story and, and that, you, that you came to interview. <laughs> Idan Ofer was probably the most interesting character that I interviewed because I've never met or interviewed somebody whose net worth is $4.5 billion. Uh, and uh, we met in his, his penthouse at One Rothschild, which is at the end of Rothschild Boulevard in Tel Aviv, one of these you know, overlooking the Mediterranean. He has his own private butler. While we were there being interviewed, while I was interviewing him, the doorbell rings, and in walks, and this is a few years ago, in walks Ehud Olmert. Um, shakes my hand, uh, wants to get to know me, which, which is when I realized why he actually was elected prime minister. He's very charismatic, you know. Uh, but so this is the kind of person that, that Iran Ofer, you know, hangs around with. He's very, very wealthy. Um, he's very, very savvy. Um, he's invested through the Israel Corporation and through his private arm called Quantum Pacific in many companies, many of which were, were not clean energy companies at all like the Dead Sea Works or an oil, oil refineries in Haifa. So when Shai Agassi came to him in, uh, in 2007 with really just the idea on a, on, a, on a piece of paper for what better place would be, uh, Idan listened carefully, they had a good rapport, they went down the elevator, and you, know, you all know what an elevator pitch is. That's when you, know, you have, you, you, you're in an elevator with a very successful person, an investor, who you have 15 seconds before the doors open again to pitch them on, their, on your idea. So they're literally going down the elevator. He already had gotten to know him. And at the end of the ride, Idan Ofer pulls Shai Agassi aside, puts his hand on his shoulder and says, I'm in for $100 million. <laughs> and, and he was. That was, the first, that was the first investment in the company. From there, Idan became the chairman of the board. They raised more money from Morgan Stanley and from the Maniv Group and from HSBC. Very, very big investors. But Idan was always the, the main sort of voice and really the opposition to Shai. So a lot of the book plays out as kind of a, a, a war of wits between the very powerful chairman of the board and the very powerful and charismatic CEO. And they didn't always agree on everything. So what you're alluding to with the, with the yacht story is um, Idan had this very expensive yacht, and, uh, and near the end, or the middle of 2012, at the end of the time that Shai Agassi was the CEO, um, they had been fighting and there were conflicts and there, there were all kinds of you know, questions about how much money the company was spending and whether or not Shai Agassi at this point was the right person for the job. And somebody put a copy of a, of a magazine article called Narcissistic CEOs, the Pros and Cons, I think it's the incredible pros, the, uh, the terrible cons. It's by a, a Harvard University professor, Michael McCoby. And he picks it up, it's only seven pages long, and he reads it through it, and he realizes that, at least this is what he told me um, in, when, when I interviewed him, he realized that, that the description of narcissistic CEOs applied to his CEO, Shai Agassi. The goods, all the amazing things he built, but also not being willing to listen necessarily to what other people had to say, and you know, there were a lot of different you know questions that came up. And at the end of that yacht ride, he said, "I can't work with him anymore." And uh, you know, of course, the company was already only a few weeks away from being you know, out of money, which was obviously the, the real catalyst. But at that point, Idan Ofer fired the CEO and founder and visionary of the company, which which many in the Israeli press said, okay, this is normal, you don't have your, your visionary founder forever, you hire a, a, a manager who's done this before, but it didn't play well, people lost confidence, investors lost, lost confidence, the journalists, the newspapers, you know, cr you know, attacked Better Place, and it never recovered. It, it went out of business about six months later.